everyone. Welcome both to the people that are here and those who are listening online. If you are visiting with us today or if you have a special prayer concern, please see one of these little cards on the, in the pew in front of you and fill them out for us and put them in the offering plate. Now please stand and join us in our first hymn if you are able. Number 711 for all the saints and we'll be singing verses 1, 2, 4, and 6. please join me in the call to worship. Lord, be with us when our lives seem embedded in sorrow and sadness. Lord, have mercy on us. Open our hearts to receive your healing grace. Prepare us to be children of the light rather than dwellers in darkness. Throughout all our days, you have been with us. Be with us again. Remind us of your presence and healing mercy. Join me now for the affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, our only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Amen. To judge the dead and the dead. The, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
piece, please. This morning's reading is Psalms 145. I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meet you on your wonderful works. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord, let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Colin Higgs, and I'm blessed to be the youth and children's pastor here at Watkins. Would you all now please join me for our pastoral prayer? We give you thanks, O oh God, for all the saints who ever worshipped you, 
whether in arbors or cathedrals, wooden churches or cement meeting houses. We give you thanks, O God, for hands lifted in praise, manicured hands and hands stained with grease or soil, strong hands and hands gnarled with age, holy hands. We give you thanks, God, for hardworking saints, whether hard-hatted or aproned, blue-collared or three-piece suit. They left their mark for you, for us, for our children to come. Thank you for the sacrifices made by those who have gone before us. Bless the memories of your saints. As we remember today on All Saints Day, we also celebrate birthdays. We also celebrate weddings of our organist, Chris Harbison. May we learn how to walk wisely from their examples of faith, dedication, worship, and love. And we pray as Jesus prayed before us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to now invite our ushers forward during our time of offertory prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, we are your servants. We live, move, and have our being in you. We give you thanks and call upon your name. <clears throat> Lord, we love you for listening to us and responding in kindness, compassion, and righteousness. We pray that you will now receive our offerings and tithes, multiply them to make your work and words possible here, the ministries of Watkins and beyond. And in Jesus Christ, amen.
So that is uh, Andy Stanley's son. And so if you're familiar with Andy Stanley, he's a pastor of North Point uh, Ministries in Atlanta, Georgia. That's his son, and, and he's a really great comedian. So if you want to look him up after service, he, uh, he's pretty entertaining. But I think he gets kind of at the point. It's awkward to talk about money, isn't it? It's awkward to talk about money, but that's exactly what we're doing for the next couple of weeks, and, and hopefully in ways that are, are playful, but also honoring and reverent to how we make our money, how we spend, and how we save. And so that's what we'll be focusing on this week as we talk about If Money Talked. And so I ask that you'll stand this morning for the reading of this morning's gospel. Our gospel lesson comes from the 25th chapter in the Gospel of Matthew, verses 14 through 15 and verse 19. Hear these words. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who is leaving on a trip. He called his servants and handed his possessions over to them. To one he gave five valuable coins, and to another he gave two, and to another he gave one. He gave to each servant according to that servant's ability, then he left on his journey. After the man left, the servant who had five valuable coins took them and went to work doing business with them. He gained five more. In the same way, the one who had two valuable coins gained two more, but the servant who had received the one valuable coin, dug a hole in the ground, and buried his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So last week, we talked about what we did with our spare money. And we had a conversation of, uh, we may not feel like we have all this extra money or spare money. We discovered that we probably do if we've ever upgraded a phone or a car or went on any sort of vacation, right? We all have spare money, but it just may not feel like we do. Why? Well, it's that dirty little word called greed. Annie Stanley teaches in in one of his books this this quote, greed is the assumption that it's all for my consumption. It's a great quote, isn't it? Greed is the assumption that it's all for my consumption. Not only do I think this is a great quote, I, I honestly think it is totally true. When we start to think that all we have is ours and we get to pick and choose how we consume it and the money becomes all about me, then we're in trouble. Then we're in trouble. Jesus disagrees with this idea throughout the Gospels, and he states that life does not consist in abundance of possessions. You see, life itself, no matter what commercial on the TV may yell at you at time for time, is not about the race for more money, right? Would you agree with that statement? It's not about the race for more money. Life is also not a a race for the newer or the most upgraded or the most flashy or the most renovated of things on earth. But perhaps if you took a look at the commercials on TV or maybe in the type of TV shows I like to watch, and maybe you do as well, we may be quick to think so. Money instead is a tool. It's a tool. It's a, that's it. It's a, it's a way to do something meaningful with life itself. It adds meaning to our life, but is not the meaning of life. So that was last week. This week, we're going to take a little bit kind of different perspective. We're, we're talking about what would it look like if we could sit down with a chair in front of us and we had our, our dollar bill in front of us. Remember my little piggy dollar bills, right? Please Continue to not spend them, okay? You'll get in trouble and get me in trouble. But if you sat down and you had a conversation with that, what would it tell you? What would it tell you? Would it be approving of the ways that you spend and save your money? Would it be affirming of the values that you have? Or would it give you the silent treatment for a little bit? Or perhaps say something else? So if we could sit down with money and have a conversation with it, what would it say? And my argument, I think, throughout this whole series is that it would probably say a lot of things that Jesus did in the Gospels. So this week, we're going to look at the second thing that money might tell us. And if money talked, it might say this, the moment you think you own me, I actually own you. The moment you think you own me, 
I actually own you. To illustrate this, I'm going to put a graph on the screen. I am not a mathematician by any means. I am a pastor, right? I also am a pastor that studied music in college. So I have nothing to do with math whatsoever. Um, But I'm going to put a a chart on here, and you can kind of help me look through it. Um, Here's a chart of how the typical American spends and earns their money. It's a typical one. This is kind of what we look at. So you have um, the first kind of 35 years of your life, so from 5 years to 15 to 25, um, and then that's the way that it goes this way. What is that one called, the, the sideways one? The X, is that what it's called? I don't know. The X axis, does everyone agree with Colin on that? He said it with confidence, so I agree with him, and so we have that one. And then you have the one that goes up, and so it's kind of like the dollar signs are going up, so that means more. So the time is going this way. Dollar signs are going this way, so more this way, more that way, right? So as you can see on here, kind of income goes up and down, but it, but it continues to go up throughout our lives. And then our spending kind of has some spurts. I would probably call the $2 right there that spurt. That's probably children. Turns out they cost a lot of money, don't they? No one warned me about that one, but it goes up and down and then kind of spirals up. But it, as you can see, would you say this is a healthy person the way with their finances? Semi, right? You say, yeah, yeah. The income is continuing to go up. The spending is continuing to go up. So you had some years that you spent more than you brought in. Okay, that's, that's totally fine. But on the other side of this, we also know um, that this is not necessarily how everyone spends, right? So this would make sense because, say, if you made $45,000 a year, you could spend $45,000 a year. Hopefully you'd save a little bit. John Wesley said, earn all you can. Save all you can, give all you can. So hopefully there's a little bit, but you could kind of equal out on that as our salaries go up. So do our spending and our lifestyles. But sometimes life can look kind of like that. Would you say this person has a healthy financial picture? (laughs) No. Does anyone know who? We won't ask that. If you know of somebody who does this. When we, this kind of happens, right? Things aren't going as quiet as we would plan it, right? So as you see, kind of this axis, Colin called it the x-axis. I, I'll agree with it for now, I guess. So you have this kind of the as you get older and then as you spend more money this way and this one, your spending is kind of way up there, right? And what your income is not keeping up. This is probably when people get in trouble. Would you agree? When we get in trouble, we may know folks like this. When we spend over what we make and expenses exceeding our income, well, that leads to big trouble, whether that's a personal thing, a corporation thing, right? If you say this, you said this is not healthy. So what do we do in these situations? What do we do when it's kind of out of whack? Well, we try to find a way out. We try to find a way out. We try to find what can I do with this kind of trouble, man? I've kind of dug myself in a hole. Can I spend my way out of it? And so Visa and American Express, student loans, maybe we'd be on this. They now become our master. They now become our master. They start to own us. And our master can kind of tell us, right, we can't buy this or we can't drive this or your kids can't go to this school or that school or that sport or this sport. You're underneath the power of people and companies you probably have never talked to in your entire life. This proves our second point, right? The moment you think you own me, I actually own you. You see, thank God Jesus addressed this. Thank God Jesus addressed this. And what I think is Jesus, what he says, really lines up of what our money would say. We do not own our money. Yes, we may think we do because we earned it. When I look at my paycheck twice a month, right? I don't get a paycheck, I guess. When I look at my direct deposit right on my computer or my app, it says that it is written out to Robert Tucker. I won't give you my last four of my social or anything like that or tell you my mother's maiden name, but it would say Robert Tucker on that deposit, right? And it's made out. It's mine. I have earned it with my hard earned work, but Jesus has something to say about that. You see, I wonder. I wonder if he'll still be here when we're gone. We can't take it with us. 
You see, when we, when we die, I, I heard a pastor once say this, and I, and I love this kind of idea or this metaphor. I'm a visual person. He said, when we die, our hearse will not be pulling a U-Haul trailer with all our possessions and money inside of it, right? That would be silly. But how often do we treat it as such? We don't own it. We manage it. And we can't take it with us. You see, in our passage this morning, there's a a wealthy man, and this wealthy man is on a journey, and this wealthy man uh, represents God in this parable. A parable is a a story of sorts. It kind of has different hidden meanings throughout it. Jesus told these. It's one of his favorite ways to preach and and really get along with people who are following him. So they would tell him these stories, and they would think, okay, what truth is hidden within this story? Where do I find myself inside of the story? And what does this story tell me about God? And so the wealthy man here that gives these folks money represents God. And the servants represent, who do you think? Us, right, bingo, A+. plus. The servants represent us. So the wealthy man, he goes and he approaches these three servants and he he gives uh, them the money. He doesn't loan them his money. He doesn't give them his money. Instead, he asks asks their servants to manage his money. They owned 0% of that money. And the wealthy man owned how much? 100%. This is a good financial lesson. It's easy math for a preacher, so that's good. That's the point of the story. The wealthy man owns 100%. The servants own zero. See, the master got his servants together and gave them each a portion of his wealth and asked them to manage it while he goes on the trip. And two of these men, they do very well, right? They doubled the, the master's money. The one man, though, just buried it straight in the ground, protected it, and, and made sure it didn't go anywhere. And at the end of the story, at the end of the story, the servants didn't keep the money in which they were managing. And say, oh, thank you very much. Here's a, a piece of it. Or you've done very well. I've decided just to give it to you generously. That's not how it works, although I wish it was. It all went back to the manager. They knew from the beginning that they were not the owners of the money, but they were tasked with being the managers of the money. How many of you have a, a, a personal financial planner anybody have is that a weird is that a personal question i don't know that's a kind of weird question i guess mr stanley would probably ask that one but a financial planner it's uh i'm not sure if it's a personal question or not i'll just ask it but if you had a a financial this is how preachers do it if you had one right a financial planner they wouldn't be tasked with just keeping all of your money would they you want to give them a hundred percent of what you're entrusting them with that would be a bad financial planner they also want to be tasked with burying, burying your money into the ground, no longer to be seen until you ask for it again. Well, anybody can do that. They would be responsible for sorts, right? They would be responsible helping you keep track of the details of your money and help you get the most out of your money to bring meaning to your life. You see, when you manage, when you manage someone else's money, you are both responsible and accountable. You're both responsible and accountable. That's the combo we're looking at here. You see, in your life, in your life, do you feel responsible for what you're managing from God? Do you feel responsible for the way that you manage the things that God has entrusted you with? Could you, could you give, a, a much like a financial planner, could you give a, a, a decent, good account of where your money has gone in the last five to ten years? Would you be proud to kind of go through your bank statement with God and say, God, here is the way that I honored and I valued you and your creation. Here are the ways if you just looked at it, you didn't know me, and you could put my values right in front of me because of the ways that I both earned and spent my money. God, it is all yours. Would you be proud? 
You see, in our, our story this morning, we're all managers of sorts. We're all managers of, of both God's resources and God's finances from the book of Genesis to on, right? We feel like that we are, are able to be give uh, a responsibility over all that God has given us. Everything is a gift from God to us, but they aren't gifts to do with whatever we please. There's this great story. There's a great story, and I feel like I probably tell it every year. So if you're like, man, I have heard this preacher, I have heard this story before, it's probably because you've heard me tell it. <laughs> but John Ortberg is a pastor, and he's a pastor out in, in California. He's a brilliant author and, and, and resource for us, and he has this beautiful story he tells all the time, and I've just picked it up. It's in this story in which he tells of how the, the first day he beat his grandmother Monopoly. <laughs> Do you know the story? The first day he beat his grandmother in Monopoly. Did you ever beat your grandmother in Monopoly? No, some of you are thinking, no, I oh, still haven't done it, right? I know. But it was a great story. It happened in Marvin Gardens, and it's, he, it's, he talks about how he just wiped her clean off the board at the end of the day. And it felt so good because his grandmother was the one that had taught him how to play Monopoly. He, she was the one that kind of coached him through it, kind of gave him all the, uh, the ways to do it and kind of the stamina that goes in to playing Monopoly. And now he had finally outplayed her. He has the playbook and he beat his grandmother. And he relished his victory. He kind of rubbed it in her face. And not very good, but he was very proud of himself. But at the end of this kind of relishing to say, I beat you, grandmother, she taught him a far more important lesson with these words. She said, John, when the game is over, it all goes back in the box. And at that moment, she slowly clears off all of the cash the hotels, the pawn pieces, and delicately folds up the, 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 the board and puts it into the box and the lid on it and just smirks at them. <laughs> it's true. At the end of the day, all that money, all those properties, all those houses and hotels he acquired, John acquired, really weren't his to begin with, were they? They had been in the box before he had played. And they would be there after he stopped. That at the end of the day, it all goes back into the box. You see, what are you going to do with what you've been given? Knowing that it all goes back. You see, what I, I've learned from the saints that have come before us as we celebrate and will continue to celebrate All Saints Day. As I have learned from those who have, have come and gone, I would say the wise sages of our life, the many mentors that we've had, for the beautiful women and men in our life who, who have come and gone, has given us and gifted us so much, I am just at awe of the stories and the lessons that we are given, aren't you? For the many ways in which they have taught us what it means to live life fully, for the many ways in which they have shown us that if you just follow into the footsteps of Jesus, you will find a joy-filled life. Do you know those people? For the folks maybe even here in the Watkins Memorial United Methodist Church, as we remember those who have come and gone, I want you to remember, my friends, and a part of remembrance is not just a, a memory thing. See, our memories come and go, don't they? But as we remember, we remember, we put the body back together. To remember all the saints that have come before and all the saints that will come after us. That they have taught us what it means to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. That have showed us that we are just servants, that we are just those who walk in the path, that we are just those that get to be entrusted with these giftedness of God. I thank God for those saints in my life, and I hope you will too. For the faithful who have come and gone. 
those who have completed this race in life and now become a part of that great cloud of witnesses. For those stories that just reverberate in our hearts and our minds of those. No longer walking with us, but are with us in truth and in spirit. Yeah. May it be so. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you that there's nothing we could ever do or ever say to make you love us any more or any less than they do right now. And God, as we come to approach your table of grace, we remember of the past and the present and the future of all your saints, who you are and who you've created us to be. As love filled, baptized by the Holy Spirit, able to walk each day with you, oh God, we give you thanks. That we may find ourselves so in awe with the one who has created all things. And that we may find ourselves at all at your table of love and grace. God, be with us as we remember both what you have done and together as a global body. Pour into us, God, your Holy Spirit into this place that we may find you in even deeper ways. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's beloved children said, Amen. We now come a time of our service where we will enter into Holy Communion. What does that mean? We will come to this table of love and grace today. We will come and we will dine knowing that it is all God's and none of it is ours. That we receive by grace in grace to be grace to this world. And so that means it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done or where you come from. If you're a member here of Watkins or not, you are welcome here to this table. There are no exceptions at God's table. Amen. And you are welcome here in this place. To both go through the liturgy. Liturgy means work of the people you'll find on here. You'll also find some directions on how we do this together as a part of our liturgy as well. We will be remembering those who have come and gone. We remember those who are part of our own family here at Watkins. There will be a time which I will raise their name together. And also there will be a time of silence where I will welcome you. If you'd like to lift up a name, you are able and free to do so. And during communion, as you come and receive the bread in the cup, there will also be a candle lit down here that you may light someone who has come and gone as well, if you'd like to. Let us remember and come together in this table of grace. You'll find the liturgy in the screens behind me. So the Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Miriam and Moses, God of Joshua and Deborah, God of Ruth and David, God of the priests and the prophets, God of Mary and Joseph, God of the apostles and the martyrs, God of our mothers and our fathers, God of our children to all generations. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread. Gave thanks to you. Gave it to disciples and said, take, 
eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. Gave disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so remembrance of mighty acts found in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit and all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ. Redeemed by his blood. And oh God, especially today. May we renew our communion with all of your saints. Especially with those whom we name before you this morning. God, we begin. With our friend and loved one, James Cap Cottle. And God, you may hear the names that we lift out both out loud and those that stay upon our hearts and our minds right now. Oh God, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, strengthen us today to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. I'll invite you now to come forward for a time of Holy Communion. Pastor Colin and I will be up front in front of these pews before you. You'll come forward with palms up because there's nothing you could ever do to earn or deserve this. You are freely given this. By the power of God, you'll receive a a piece of bread from myself and you'll receive a cup from Colin. If you'd like to come into light, a candle, we encourage you to do so. And remembrance of those may you have lost in the last year or even beyond that. As we celebrate that, as we dine at God's table, it's not just us physically who do but those who have come and gone as well.
ask them now stand as you are able as we proclaim and we sing God's promises found and shall we gather at the river United Methodist Hymnal 723 let us stand and sing together announcements to lift up and then I'll ask Ellen to come forward as well. The first is we are having charge conference next week and next Sunday at two o'clock at St. Matthew's United Methodist Church. We do a cluster charge conference. If you're a part of the church council, you're welcome and invited um, to join us there at two o'clock next Sunday afternoon. A couple other announcements you'll find on the screen in front of you as well. We are still RSVPing, reserving for our last churchwide dinner of this year. And so that is November 16th coming right up. And so come join us for that. We do ask that you RSVP so we know how much food to prepare. Kathy Hoffman will be um, the chef in charge for that dinner. So you know it's going to be fantastic. Um, I encourage you to join with us. Also coming up. There we go. It's the One Combined Service on Commitment Sunday this week. You should have received a paper. It's pretty old school. A paper a stewardship letter with testimonies in it and the next upcoming budget for 2023 and a commitment card in that. And we ask that you'll prayerfully consider um, committing to God through your finances through the next year. And so I encourage you to pray about that and to join us at that one service November 20th. And right here, we'll have a combined service as we celebrate on both what God has done in the last year and celebrating already. Looking forward to what God will do um, through Watkins United Methodist in the year to come. So I'll ask Ellen to come forward at this time as she has an announcement to make as well. well just wanted to say that uh, we know that last month, the month of October, was Pastor Appreciation Month. And we... <clears throat> went through the month, and this Sunday we are saying thank you. Colin, come up here too. <laughs> to both them, we also have uh, uh, a pastor appreciation memento to Elmer. 
which we'll give to him at the Hispanic service. But uh, we do appreciate both of you all and all your work, and this is just an affirmation that we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Give me the right one. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. I'll speak on behalf of the pastors that we are grateful and to be here at this place and do feel affirmed and encouraged here. And thank you for serving alongside of us here at Watkins United Methodist Church. Now receive this benediction. Now go in the name and the power of Jesus Christ. As a redeemed person who walks with all of the saints, leading a life that follows in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace, my friends. Thank mm -hmm. you.